I'm Stefan Bauman and welcome to another podcast. Today I'm really excited because we're going to be talking about this very core of my teaching and that is how the viewer actually reacts to what we see. Painting is silent poetry and it's about communication and if the artist doesn't reach out with an idea and the viewer gets it, is it really art at that point? Furthermore, we're going to be talking about focal points and what they are and how they affect the viewer. And finally, we get to that question about whether or not we should create prints or not. And how do we take photographs of our work? So sit back and relax and enjoy this podcast. It really is about knowing what it is that you were trying to say and whether or not the viewer gets it. And that's really what the foundation of my teaching is. Um, Of course, part of my foundation is also painting what you see. And part of painting what you see is that we acknowledge that we all as human beings see things the same way. Otherwise, we wouldn't have language. And so there's a certain common thread that binds us as, as people. And it's through understanding, you know, language that we actually understand you know, communication. And basically painting is communicating without words. It's silent poetry. And when we start doing uh, uh, painting, it's because we think we wanna do some pretty pictures. And so we go download a calendar that we just love and we start you know, painting that. But after a while that gets boring and we want something else. To share a little story, and, and you know, I think Zoom is really great for me because I've got all of you on mute and I get to just ramble on and talk and that's what I do best. In fact, on YouTube, that's the thing that people always complain about. They said, you know, Stefan, you talk too much. And I go, I know, but there's little words of wisdoms and things that you can learn from if you just listen between the lines. So bear with me. These stories are or, yeah, I, as I get older, I realize, you know, why old men talk so much about the past, because it's all those little stories that people can learn how to do things. But I got a phone call from somebody in Australia. And um, I'd say here, stop me if you heard this story, but you can't. So I'm, I'm on my way here. So I got a phone call from a from an artist and um, he told me who he was. And I didn't recognize the name right away. And uh, um, he says, I live in Australia and I'm, you know, a top tier artist. In fact, I sell my paintings for around 80 to $100,000 a piece. He's got galleries all over the world and he's published in all the magazines and uh, he's got work for the next 20 years. And he says, Stefan, I've got a problem. And I said, what is it? And so I mean, I said, what was your name again? And so I looked it up and I was like, oh my God, I know you. And he goes, yeah. He says, yeah. I mean, and, and a lot of you, would, if you knew who he was in research, but I promised him I wouldn't say his name. But so I said, what's your problem? And he said, I can paint the rest of my life, I never sell another painting. I have enough money, you know, there is. I have galleries that call me every day saying, I want paintings, I want paintings. I've got people that are waiting for paintings. I'm, I'm set. And I spend so much time now just staring at my canvases, painting nothing. And he says, I even hired people to, to nudge me to paint. And I said, oh, that's really too bad. Um, You know, it's like every artist should have that problem. So I said, so what's your painting process? And he says, well, when I was 32, I decided to do a survey. So I did a two-year survey to find out what is it that everybody likes in a painting. And so he actually developed a formula. And everything that they said, they like purple, they like blue, they like flowers, they like canvas, you know, all this stuff. He did, he put it all together and he devised a formula for the perfect paintings. And uh, it worked. He put it all together and it worked. And so basically, he would search the world over to find the perfect painting 
so that he could paint it and sell it. Okay. So he says, you know, and so consequently people loved it and they're buying them and galleries want them. I'm, you know, but I just, I just don't find myself going to the easel. I have to be nudged. I paint somebody to, to, to nudge me, to nag at me. And so I said, let me, let me think about it. So I went out into my field and worked with my horses for a while, wondering why is this man not motivated when he's got everything that every artist would possibly want. And then I figured it out and I called it back and I said, you know what the problem is? Art is autobiographical. It's about your life. It's not about pretty pictures and calendars and stuff. It really is about relaying your personal experiences. And I said, you really don't have the pleasure of ever painting your children. You will never have the pleasure of painting your dog or your wife or picnics that you take on with your friends, like places that you visit, your backyard, little found treasures that you find in your house, little things you've uh, collected or, or inherited from people. Art is a personal journey. It is, it is autobiographical. It's about your life. And painting pretty pictures is one thing, but it gets pretty dull after a while. And really the great artists are the ones that actually capture their lives. And so it just gives you a little bit of an insight. Art is really hard. I don't know why people go, oh, yeah, I, I love these artists on YouTube. They go, oh, look how easy. And I was like, I sit there at the plein air conference sometimes and I go, are you kidding me? They're up there and they go, oh, isn't this fun? Isn't this easy? You know, it's all, it's like everybody's trying to market, you know, the whole art thing as being something that you two could do, right? But art is really, really difficult. You guys are, should get, you know, medals for going into battle. There are a lot of things you could do that are a lot easier than painting. You know, if you don't believe me, watch Antiques Roadshow. And you look at all the crafts, all the things that people make, and then all of a sudden, what happens? There's a painting that comes up. And all of a sudden, you go, Harold, come over here. A painting's coming up. You know it's going to be worth a lot, you know? And so, you know, so consequently, a million dollars for a painting. Wow, why is that? Because not very many people can do it well. And then, uh, you know, and you do this well. They build a museum. They don't do that for auto mechanics. They don't build an, a museum for great auto mechanics, but for artists, they build museums for them if you're great. They actually will put a plaque on the outside of your town saying, home of. So, you know, you, you, it's a difficult journey and there's a lot to learn. And so, yeah, I tell people to darken things because I want the contrast of light, but it still has to be within the value. I mean, every brushstroke has to be uh, the correct value, the correct temperature, the correct color the correct stroke and the correct edge. Every brush stroke. Every brush stroke has to be thought out as if it were calculated like a like a, a tax preparer has to do at the end of the year. Every number has to be. That's why we're mentally exhausted after we paint for a while. So soon our conversation switches over to focal points and the importance of focal points. Although Painting is very difficult. It's not impossible if we study some of the keys. And I list all of my keys on the Patreon station. One of the keys that we have to pay attention to is focal points. What is a focal point and why is it important? So listen in. There's no focal point. You know, this has a focal point. When, every, when this popped up, everybody looked at this. And here we're like, la, 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 la. It's like you have this wandering. Nothing in here is really striking us to say, look at me. And if you don't have that in a painting, it's gone. The painting's just, and people don't get that. It's like when I go, students, where are the focal points? And they go, I don't know. I didn't think about it. Where do you think it should be? And I'm like going, mm. I talk about this in my videos. It's like you choose a focal point and then you throw it at your viewer. I mean, that's, get that, is like with no focal point. And you had a beautiful focal point in here. It's a little warm. 
You know, if, if you take a blank canvas and yeah, I've seen this where like they'll have like a, a storm in a circus tent or some kind of, you know, big thing. And it's just all dark and there's everything, you know. And then they'll have the little opening of the circus tent, you know, down in the bottom right, like you, you have here somewhere right there. Where, where's the viewer going to go? Now, they're going to go into the bottom right. I mean, you know, it grabs our attention. We usually see straight out. We usually see straight out. And so that's usually in the middle of the painting. And that's why the focal point should be where we're looking at. But all, all what I can do is tell you, you know, th this is the reaction from the viewer. And, you know, I, I said a show of hands, and I don't know if you could see the video or not. And I said, how many of you thought that this was uh, the, the, the center focal point? Everybody raised their hand. That's what we're seeing. So if I looked at the source photo, I probably would agree with you that, you know, the lighting was there. But that doesn't matter either way. You know, nobody has to be right or wrong here. But the thing is, you know, it, you have to get that. If, if, if you're going to communicate to somebody, it's got to be like, cohesive it's got to be correct 100 percent if you have a horizontal painting you want to have a um uh more verticals and if you have a vertical painting you want more horizontals try not to sign in the water that's a big that's a that's a, a wives tale but basically if you sign in the water your career will sink that's but where, kind of, where would you sign it you would sign it on the left hand side in the rocks over there or you would put a rock out here a lot of, uh, you know, the old artists would stick a, a crate in the water or, uh -huh. or a mask uh, laying in the water or something like that so they can get their scenery. But it's just kind of one of those those things that artists know. There is so many things that you visually have to think about when you do a painting. That's why, you know, I, you know, that's why my coaching students stay with me. That's why Lance is back on here. I mean, he couldn't really handle the coaching all the time and things. So, so you know, this works for him. But the thing is, he's back here because when you sit in your studio by yourself and you're not getting feedback, you make these some mistakes, you know, and it's, um, it's uh, yeah, it's just, it's kind of hard to do this on your own. You know, you don't see things. Um, Winston Churchill said it takes two artists to paint a painting. He said one to paint it and one to tell him when it's done, you know, but basically it's like to critique it and correct all the mistakes. And so what, you know, I think this, these Zoom calls are fabulous because you get some coaching or insight or, you know, and this is another thing, you know, if we had 25 or 30 paintings and, you know, a lot of them, if they just sucked and were really bad, we would say, okay, this is bad because of this, 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 and we would go through more and more paintings. We would have, we would have uh, more interesting, exper you know, things where people did stuff, and you'd have more insights. The more insights you have, the more knowledge you get, and hopefully you start seeing these things. I mean, most of you looked at this and said, wow, that looks really great, and none of you really thought about, wow, that line and that line are like parallel, you know, so it's, it's like, you know, you, 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 yeah, and we could start taking apart little things all over the painting. But the thing is, you you really have to have other eyes on a painting. You just don't know. You know, and you don't know what you don't know. And without having somebody say, except your spouses, I mean, God love them, but they come by and they go, everything you do is so wonderful. But yeah, I want you to know, do you like this? And they go, is that a trick question? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so... Um, uh just just get that it's it's good to have other eyes on a painting winston churchill was an artist very few people kind of know that he wrote a book on little sayings um about art he thought art was was so much more harder than going into battle and uh so he took a painting and he was a watercolorist and he wrote this little book I can't tell you what the thing is, but you can Google it and find out. And I still think you can buy it. I, think, I still think it's published. But it's a lot of these little insights. And one of the other insights that he said was, it takes two lifetimes to learn to be an artist. So few people actually know that Winston Churchill was an artist. So our conversation turns back to a central focal point, what makes up a central focal point. So let's tune back in again.
you've got, you know, when you squint your eyes, look at how big this central focal point is. And so one thing that I talk about is your central focal point should be about the size of an egg. It's about this big. And I usually use, used to say it's, it's like the size of an eye or an eyeglass. I used to say it's like the old, um, right. you remember the old dollars, the Eisenhower dollars that were this big that, yeah, I was so familiar with them because they were mainly made for slot machines in Nevada. And so I grew up in Lake Tahoe. So, you know, that was just part of what we carried around with these Eisenhower dollars. They're huge. But that was about the size of, of uh, the center focal point. That's all we can see. And if you don't believe me and you doubt, then, you know, later on this evening, look into your spouse's eye and you will notice that you can't look at the right eye and the left eye at the same time. <laughs> You go back and forth. And if you go, well, that's not true, then, you know, remember back when you talked to somebody that had a lazy eye and you were not quite sure which eye you were supposed to look at? That's how micro-focused we look at things. Okay, so we're going to get to our question and answer uh, segment here. Um, and I will uh, stop sharing the screen. Get to see everybody back here again. And I'm going to read a question. Um, question th about this is about photographing your artwork to submit for shows or use on websites, social media. Um, and so one of the questions that the student asked me today, do you take your own or have them done by a photographer? How to take best photos of your paintings without spending an arm and a leg? That's a great question. What type of camera do you use? That's a great question. How to set up, i.e. lighting, angle, uh, easiest software to use for working with images. Who do you recommend for making prints of your work? And so we got a few questions here that we want to answer. We'll take them one by one. Uh, this will be definitely interesting for most artists that are interested in getting to your website and part of our, our uh, marketing on the third tier of the, the uh, Patreon site is the marketing. But I think this question is good just overall. It is one of the biggest things that even I have to deal with at times. So first thing, let me just uh, come out of the closet here and, and tell people that when I, when I, do something that's really major and I want to have a really good good photo, I put it into the hands of a professional. And they get a scan, they do color balance, they spend hours and hours and hours doing stuff that I, uh, I mean, I open a Photoshop and it's like, I'd rather spend time painting than worrying about my, the photography. Um, the, the reality is, is that you paint a painting and you sell it and it's done. And so pretty much we think that's the end of our life. When we are painting um, something, we want to think of it as something that, that it, is, it is something we do that will be for the future at some point. And we're actually creating images so that we can use those over and over and over again. And so we actually are kind of considered at this point with social media content providers. And you have to kind of think about that when you're doing a painting. And all of a sudden it makes you realize that, wow, I could spend more time on my painting. Because the reality is, as you sell a painting, you get a thousand bucks for it. And all of a sudden, boom, you get a car bill and then it's gone. It's gone. So all that work is just gone. So when you think about that, it's like, it's kind of unfair that you have that. But the thing is, the one thing we do have is the image. And so, wow, it's really important to have good images because you get to use those the rest of your life. It is a foundation for galleries to look at your work and collectors and the possibility of having prints. And, you know, and the thing is, if you really do something that's really great, it's just the foundation. So when we look at artists like Thomas Kincaid, that actually created his whole net worth through prints. And I still meet people who go, well, I have an original Thomas Kincaid at home. And I go, it's not an original. They go, oh yes, it is. Look, it's got all the texture on it. So no, that's, yeah, his income was $10 million and it's documented because it was a public company. 
um, ten million dollars a year and so there's no way you could paint that kind of painting in one person they were all prints thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of prints and let's talk a little bit about the print market real quick so with Thomas Kincaid so when you look at Thomas Kincaid's print market he would have a limited edition of a hundred thousand in that size if you read the the fine print it would always say in that size and so then he'd have another hundred thousand in another size and so he could take that one image and he could reprint it in one size and then change it in another size and change it in another size so if you're going to go into the print market you just kind of have to get that that uh uh, you can actually manipulate you know, your letter of authenticity to be that you can create more and more and more products. So, but the foundation of that is, is, the, is the photograph. And so if you're creating work that you really want to use and do, put it in the hands of professionals um, because they just do it better than, than anyone else. Um, and they scan it nowadays and they piece it together and then they color correct it, um, and it could be quite expensive. For one image that I, I usually spend about 100 to $150 for the one image, but that image is, is uh, large enough so I could almost print any size of canvas that I want. It's a huge negative um, or a huge file. So it's, it's really crucial that you have uh, really good photographs. Now, we cannot do that on every painting, so the next best thing is is looking at what we can do and i don't have that done on all of my paintings just paintings that i know that someday i may do an addition so but you do have to you do have to learn how to take your own photographs now um i have a camera that i use predominantly for uh, picture taking uh, and it's a digital camera it is set for very high pixels and uh, the way that I set it up is very scientific. I mean, I have worked this out for years and, and um, I'm going to give away my secret right now. And uh, so you all of you might want to pull out a sheet of paper and, and write this down so that you get the se Bauman's secret to taking pictures uh, of, of his paintings. And here you go. I'm going to wait just a sec so you can write this down. So, uh, you go outdoors and you figure out which ways point south. And you look, you know, north and you try to find a surface like a fence or the side of a house. And you go up with a very large nail and you nail a nail onto the fence or the side of the house. I actually use the side of my house. Um, then I hang my picture pointing south on the south side of my house and I wait till 1202 uh, and there outside of that I have a tripod and my tripod sits my camera and my camera is focused at my at my painting and I have a timer set and it's set for five seconds so me touching the, the little button on top um, doesn't jiggle the camera to get a little distortion. And I like to do this on a semi-cloudy day. And so at 12.05, I wait for a cloud to drift over just ever so slightly. And when that perfect little shadow goes over, I touch my camera, boom, it takes a picture. The, the, the thing that you have to get is that lighting has to be kind of consistent. It can't really come from the left. It can't really come from the right. It kind of has to kind of come down. And so when you're in full on light and the light comes down almost directly on it, you get less glare. And it's really important when you're doing canvases that have texture on them too. You kind of have to watch out that, you know, at a certain time, those t the, all those bumps, that's why I recommend putting a uh, painting on panels instead of canvas. I think anyway, it's, it's a waste of money to throw paint, um, paint on a canvas until you get to a huge canvas, but that's another story. Um, but you got to watch all those pores because they'll actually read too. And it just all depends on the direction of light. But the more straight you have the lighting, especially outside, if you can get a little overcast, 
that's just great. You take a picture, you try not to touch the lens, and use a high pixel rate on your camera, you're good. But some of you want to use your, your cell phone. Now, the cell phone is actually as good as anything that's out there. When we did our PBS television show, we had big beta cameras. And we had uh, specs from PBS that we had to reach a certain level of, of quality before it was broadcast, like broadcast quality. And it was very expensive to do. Now, a simple cell phone can actually do what we were, what we had to spend $50,000 for. You can actually get out of your camera. You can shoot a, a, a PBS show from your, from your own phone. So the technology is amazing. And so the same thing, you put your camera, your cell phone uh, on a tripod and you try to do the same thing. Now, if you want to take a picture indoors, the thing is, if you've got a light coming this way, you need a light coming this way. And it's good to have a light this way. So you kind of have to set up this, this triadic kind of lighting source so that one light cancels the other. So you get that kind of flat look. Uh, and then same thing with your camera, you set it. So... Um, that would be my advice. You could use your cell phone. I, I use my other camera because I just have it set at a really high pixel eight and I can do good. And most of the photographs that you see are photos that I've taken. It is kind of difficult. Um, uh, software and images and stuff. Uh, you know, any of the, anything I do is just the simple little software that the camera comes with. Or, or a simple little, um, you know, uh, Picasso or something. Um, I can edit. I can do all kinds of things when it comes to Photoshop. Man, it's just, it's to be, it's, I can get so long and then all of a sudden I get this loop and I can't get rid of it and I start deleting it. And it's like, ah, Photoshop. And it's, the learning curve on Photoshop is just too big. And I'd rather spend my time painting. Someday I'm going to learn it. I know how to edit major motion pictures. I'm not, you know, illiterate when it comes to uh, to uh, things on the computer. I'm just telling people this is that Photoshop's a huge commitment, and if you do it, great. But you don't need to know it either. Just a little bit, and to filter your your photos. The idea is is if you take a really good photo, it's already color semi color corrected and stuff. It, it should be really good. Um, so uh, let's see, uh, easiest software to use um, images and iPad. Do you recommend making prints of your work? It is expensive, and then ideas on how to price prints. That was the last question. So about prints, my last minute about prints. Prints are a very expensive venture. You, you go and take a photograph and then you find some way to print it. And, you know, just take a look at what a print is. A print is basically, you know, an image spit on paper. That's why they call it sheet clay. I, I just, the, the term for sheet clay is like piss on paper or spit on paper or something like that or spit on a canvas. Yeah, so they have canvas paper that has a texture and yeah, you know, so so it's it's a viable thing. It's just that the print market is you, you know it's it's exp it, to have them do it. It costs money. If you got money to sit around, um, that's great. If you have if you have a way to market, you kind of have to think about. First, I would say, do you have a market for prints? That is the first thing that I would ask uh, before you got into the print market. Do you have a market for prints? Because if you don't have a market for prints, I wouldn't even consider doing prints. Because uh, you you end up with inventory that you will never use, you know. So so uh, you want to really evaluate: Do I want to make an investment into it? And then, do I have a marketing plan? How am I going to sell these prints? Now, the great thing about prints nowadays is that you don't have to print them; you can actually take orders and then print. But again, that's going down. Make a, a connection with a printer. Uh, have have uh, some history with them so that they understand any color corrections or the things that they have to make. You usually have to go pick up the prints or they have to be sent to you, which is another expense. And then you have to do something with them, frame them or put them behind some kind of protective thing. Some people want to retouch them. 
if you're not going to do huge amounts of texture on them, it, you, you could retouch them and they don't have any, any effect at all. Um, so the, if, you know, but you do have people, I mean, your mom calls you up and says, could I have a print of that painting? You go, okay. So I highly recommend that you, you, if you want to get prints of your painting, that you get a really good high resolution and then you go to Fine Art America. And in Fine Art America, you open up an account there. It's free for the first 20, 15, I believe. And there, you can direct your mother to go to Fine Art America, look for your gallery, and there she could find the painting of her dreams, and then she could order it there. And Fine Art America will take your, your whatever painting you submit, and they will um, put it on a canvas print and then um, send it to your mom. Fulfill the order. Go down to the post office and lick a stamp on it and send it. You don't have to spend time doing that either. Um, and you don't have to worry about insurances or if things don't get there and all the follow-up of whether or not you got paid or not and all that stuff. You don't have to worry about that. Fine Art America does it. And then they send you a little check at the end of uh, the month, which is minimal, but compared to all of the stress of putting together prints, um, you can, you know, you can revel in the fact that your mom finally got her a print of her dreams. And while she's there at Fine Art America, she could also have that same image put on a coffee cup. So every morning that uh, she has her cup of coffee, she can enjoy their print. And if that's not enough, Fine Art America will put it on tote bags and on toaster covers and on bedroom you know, sheets and on uh, whatever image. If she loves that image, she could have it everywhere she wants. And you just sit there and collect the dollar or two for every order. And uh, if your mom really loves that painting so much, you can make a mint off of her just selling that and not have to fulfill anything. And what's great about it is if you decide that you want to have coffee cups at Christmas time given to everybody that you know with your image on it, you just order from your own Fine Art America account and they fulfill them and send them and your Christmas list is done. So I think if you're going to get into any kind of market like that, unless you want to get into the business of prints, Fine Art America is amazing and it's a, it's a good thing. You could, it goes on automatic. If you don't have a Fine Art America account, you should have one. And let me tell you right now, I don't get paid by them. They don't know who I exist. I have no contract with Fine Art America. I use them. I have a gallery. You can go to my Fine Art America gallery. You can see I've got about 30, 30 paintings in there. It's one of the things that we'll be talking about in the marketing and the third tier Zoom group. And uh, without further ado, if you guys have any questions don't hesitate to email me um, you know, your question, and uh, I will try to discuss it right here for you guys. And I look forward to next week, which is again our, our group meeting. And until then, you guys just keep on painting. You're rock stars, and uh, you have a great So there you have it. If you'd like to get more information about my videotapes, my podcast, my YouTube, my PBS show, my workshops in Mount Shasta, which are amazing, go to www.stephanbauman.com and there you can get all the information for all the things that we do. While you're there, you can download a free book on oil painting, everything that I know. And that's going to be there on my website, along with coaching information. If you're interested in coaching, I suggest don't hesitate. Call right now at 415-606-9074 and enroll in my coaching program. It is amazing. And I will get your artwork to the next level, guaranteed. So until the next time we meet, always remember to paint with passion. I'm Stefan Bauman. You have a grand day.